Good morning. Since you're here, you must have set your clocks ahead. So, <laughs> If you are visiting with us, we want you to know you're an honored guest. Stick around a few minutes, may get to know you a little bit better. If you would, if you'd fill out one of the white cards, uh, we may have your name and information. We would greatly appreciate it. And today we are having potluck and would ask that you stay and uh, have lunch with us. Again, uh, on our prayer list, uh, he is here, but let's keep Brother Robert Smith in our prayers. Uh, he's having pain in his ankle and, and knee. Uh, Sister B. Dunbar is in the hospital with pneumonia. Uh, again, Sister Betty and Lynn Ford need our support and our prayers. Lee Brooker's niece, Jamaica Hopkins, passed away. Uh, that funeral will be Wednesday in South Carolina, so they will be traveling and she will be staying back. So let's keep that family and, and the Brookers in our prayers as well. Again, Sister Lenny Dale Show Walter will have knee replacement on the 22nd of March. And Brother Kevin Show Walter's brother is now at home receiving therapy. Also, Sister uh, Satishaw Stantonmeyer will be traveling to Thailand for about a month. So let's keep her in our prayers and her travels. Again, there will be a baby shower. Uh, for Emily Settle, uh, Saturday the 13th of April from 2 to 4. Uh, after the morning worship, there will be a elder deacon handshake, uh, fairly short, uh, immediately following the worship service. Again, as I said, today we are having potluck, and group 3 has set up and clean up. Also, song practice this afternoon uh, at 5.15 here at the building. And the Lads to Leader Sleep In uh, will be the 15th to 16th of March. Uh, also, uh, the Secret Sister Program is going to be starting. Uh, so you can... Uh, Check out light posts for that information, and if you have any other information, you can talk to Robin Smith. And again, our Chesapeake Gospel Meeting, which will be uh, the 26th and 29th of May uh, with Brother Michael Height uh, from Bear Valley Bible Institute. Uh, and it's good to see the Mahons with us this morning, uh, and uh, any others. We welcome you back to the congregation. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements I have, and we will be led in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you bless us with. Father, that you continue to watch over us every day, and through you we live and breathe and have our being. Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son Jesus down to die on a cross, that he was willing to do that because of his great love for you and for mankind, that he was willing to sacrifice himself that we might be saved through him, through his blood, and that his church, the church of Jesus Christ, the church that he built would be established and that we could become a part of it so that we might be saved. Father, we pray a continued blessings upon the churches all throughout the land and the work that goes on there. Especially, Father, we pray your blessings upon our work going on here. In the very near future, we have many events coming up, a gospel meeting, lectureship, uh, VBS, Ladies' Day, many other things. Father, we pray your blessings upon these activities as we strive to do things all decently and in order. And Father, we're so thankful how you continue to watch over each and every one of us every day of our lives. We know that without you, there's nothing we can accomplish. But Father, we're mindful of the fact that you know our needs before we ask, but we're still expected to ask. And Father, we're mindful of those who've been mentioned this morning, 
Pray continued blessings on Brother Robert Smith. We're thankful that he's here today. We pray that you'll help his left foot or ankle to, to fully heal and as well as his right knee. Pray your blessings on Sister B. Dunbar as she's dealing with pneumonia. We pray that you'll help her to fully recover and bless her at this time in the hospital. Pray your blessings on Sister Betty and Lynn Ford as they're dealing with many health issues. And we pray that you'll help to restore them to their natural health and bless them. Pray your blessings upon the Brookers as they travel to North Carolina for the passing of Jamaica Hopkins. We pray your blessings upon her family and the great loss that this they're suffering and with the children, and we pray your blessings upon them. And Father, we're also mindful of Lenny Dale Showalter having her knee replaced soon. We pray, uh, pray that that will go successfully, that you will bless her with a full recovery. And pray also your bl blessings upon uh, Kevin's brother, um, Michael, dealing with Parkinson's disease, and now he's at home being treated. We pray that you'll continue to bless him and his family during this time. Father, we're so thankful for all your blessings in our lives. We pray that you'll continue with us as we continue here in this worship service, Father. We pray all things will be done decently and in order. And indeed, Father, we pray that we'll do everything in, in accordance with your word, that we might bring honor and glory to you with our lives. I ask you to forgive us of our sins and pray you'll be with us through this service, this worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning will be 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord on My Soul. If you're willing and able, please stand for this song. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. To bless the Lord of oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, 
Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. I worship Your holy name. I worship Your holy. Please be seated. Amen. Our next song, number 474. 474, Sing to Me of Heaven. Sing to me of heaven, sing the song of peace. From the toils that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted and are pressing so. Showers of great blessings or my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fully dream all this golden glory of it pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweet song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a favored region among the angels throng, they are happy as they sing that so sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fully dream of this golden glory of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and love till the shadows on me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of this golden glory of this pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Our next song will be number 406, 406, Worship the King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. 
It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust. Nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Psalm before the Lord's Supper, 10,000 angels. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. That's number 507 in your books. 507 in your books. Verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> they bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They Spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, Crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy.
We've come to the part in our worship where we are to remember our Lord and Savior and the death in which he endured on the cross of Calvary for the sins of mankind. But before we go any further, is there any that need a communion kit? Please raise your hand. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 23 through 29. And this was Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth concerning the Lord's Supper. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. And the Bible reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat this, my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance for me, of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So let us all keep in mind as the reason why we are partaking of the Lord's Supper and remember the sacrifice in which he endured on the cross for our sins. We have before us the emblems, the bread which represents his body that hung on the cross. And we also have the fruit of the vine, which is the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary for our sins. So at this time, we'll now have a prayer for the bread. Let us bow. Holy Father in heaven, we're thankful unto thee for this Lord's day. We're thankful for this time that we have of worship to come together to remember this sacrifice and take up this, these emblems. We're thankful for this privilege. We ask, Father, that you will bless the bread, which is the body of Christ that hung on the cross for our sins. Pray that we will partake of it in a manner that is pleasing unto thee. These blessings we do ask in Christ's most holy name. Amen. We will also have a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for this opportunity you've provided for us to be here, gathered together to worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we pray that as we take this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of your son that was shed on the cross for our sins, we can remember that sacrifice and we can also examine ourselves so that we may take it in a manner pleasing to you. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Separate and apart. Uh, from taking of the Lord's Supper, we're also commanded to give Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, 
let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So as Christians, every first day of the week, we're also commanded to give uh, as we've been prospered. God commands us not to give grudgingly or out of necessity. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. And if you wish to give uh, through the double doors, there is a basket to the right where you can put your check or your money there. You can also go onto the church's website. We have an option there where you can send the money in that way, or you can mail a check into the building as well. We'll now have a prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We pray that on the, earth, on the earth, all things be done according to your will, just as they are in heaven. Heavenly Father, this time we come to thee thanking you for all the physical blessings we have in this life. We live in a very rich country, Heavenly Father, and we thank you for all these things that we've received from thee. Heavenly Father, though, may we never forget that if all these things are lost, we're safe in your son, Jesus Christ. We really haven't lost anything but of lasting value. May we never become, become so attached to these sakes, Heavenly Father, we forget, forget the importance of serving thee. Heavenly Father, as, the, as we contribute to thee today, may we do so in a way that's pleasing to thee, uh, remembering the, the source of the things that we've received, and may these, these funds be used uh, for the good of your kingdom here in this area and around the world. We love thee so much, Heavenly Father, and ask you to please forgive us of our sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please mark number 692, 692 in your songbook. That will be the song of invitation, softly and tenderly, 692. The song before this morning's lesson will be number 587, Tis So Sweet of Trust in Jesus, number 587. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. And if you're willing and able, please stand for the song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing, cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I trust him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Please be seated.
This morning's scripture reading will be coming from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. That is, the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And I'll be reading from the New King James. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it is certainly good to see uh, all of your lovely faces this Lord's Day, uh, as we are certainly privileged uh, to be alive and to be well and in our right minds, uh, and to have the portion of health and strength that uh, we have. Uh, I am thankful for uh, your presence, for those who are members of the Chesapeake family and also for those who are visiting with us. We are just grateful to have you with us. Um, but I also am grateful uh, for two other reasons uh, that I would like to share with you that hopefully uh, will serve as a fitting introduction uh, to our uh, lesson this morning. Uh, this morning as I was um, getting ready I had my breakfast, and then I began to take some of my vitamins. And I won't tell you how many pills uh, they were, uh, but when I got to the last pill, uh, I attempted to swallow it. And I'm sure if someone can relate to this, it got caught up somewhere in here. And... I wasn't sure if it was in the right pipe or the right place or not, so I was too afraid to swallow. And so uh, I did the only thing I knew to do. I let out what felt like a roar to get it out. And thank God it came out. And immediately after that, I hear some footsteps, boom, 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 boom. Door busts open. You okay? I thought you had a heart attack. <laughs> and so I'm thankful, one, uh, that I did not meet my demise at the hands of a, a vitamin. Uh, but I'm also grateful uh, that after the week that I had, that I didn't meet my demise by way of heart attack. Last week uh, was a very stressful week in many regards, uh, was a challenging week in many regards. Uh, but in hindsight, even with the stress uh, and even with uh, the challenges, as I look back, it was a blessed week. It really was. Uh, a good sister said to me not too long ago uh, that in every challenge and every difficulty, there is a lesson and a blessing. And as I look back on last week, there were uh, lessons that I needed to learn and I'm working hard to learn. But there certainly were blessings there were relationships that have been rekindled or repurposed. They have doors that were closed are uh, now open. So it was truly a blessing. And I'm saying that to you. I'm saying that to me as we go into this lesson, because sometimes the path to the lesson, sometimes the path to the blessing, it's not always fun. Uh, it's difficult. But still yet, we must endure uh, trusting in the God of heaven 
uh, who can take what sometimes seems to be lemons, and he can turn it into lemonade. We think about that as we go further into our course of study, as we have been laboring under the theme of surrender. And as we go forward, I don't want to recap a lot of what we've said in the past, but as we go forward, looking to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, I want you to hold uh, this definition of surrender in your mind. As we look at verses 11 and 12 specifically, and the definition of surrender I want you to hold in your mind throughout the entirety of this lesson and every other lesson, hopefully soon as we wrap up uh, this course of study, is this, surrender. Uh, the idea of ceasing, ceasing to resist. To cease resistance and to submit to the will or the authority of another. As you and I, we talked about the need for us to surrender to God, surrendering ourselves in every aspect of our lives to his use and his purposes. But as you think about surrender right now, I want you to think about the idea that I'm no longer going to resist God. I'm no longer going to resist his tutelage. I'm no longer going to resist his training. I'm no longer going to resist what he's trying to teach me. And I'm just going to take my medicine. I'm just going to learn the lesson. I'm just going to submit to his will and his authority. Uh, we look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. We'll read them in their entirety, and then uh, we'll get into the meat of the lesson. Proverbs 3 and verse number 11, my son, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. What I want to impress upon your mind is that surrender and discipline go hand in hand. Surrender and discipline go hand in hand. We think about what the proverbial writer says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And as we think about that phrase, my son, here in Proverbs 3 and verse number 11, and as it is used throughout the Proverbs, it offers us some uh, significant theological insight, and it also helps us to uh, better understand uh, the context of this verse. We think about the use of my son, and it establishes a paternal or familial relationship between the speaker and the recipient, indicating that these teachings, what is about to be said, is not merely academic, nor is it impersonal, but it is imparted within a relationship, within a relationship, within a relationship of care and commitment, my son. We think about the use of my son here, and it also uh, is addressing this recipient in such a way that it is calling for his attentiveness. It is calling for his or her or his obedience. It suggests that the teachings that follow are not optional, but are crucial for the well-being and the proper conduct of the listener who is in a relationship of respect and submission to the speaker. The speaker is the father and the recipient is the son. You turn to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 1.
where the word of God reads. Hear, O sons, hear, O sons, a father's instruction and be attentive that you may gain insight. Highlighting this verse to reinforce the expectation of attentiveness and obedience when the father is speaking to his son. But not only does the use of my son help us to see that this instruction is going to take place within the context of a paternal relationship, not only does it help us to see that it's calling for attentiveness and obedience, this phrase, my son, in a broader biblical context, it signifies, it is indicative of God's covenant relationship with his people, where God is portrayed as a loving and nurturing father, And he, his people, are his children. The verse says, my son. And the instruction within this context, the instruction is for the son. The instruction is for us as the people of God from God not to do something. There's something that we are exhorted not to do. And the text says, my son, do not despise. Do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Now, we think about this word discipline. I just want you to stay with me for a little while and hopefully we'll tie all of this together and it'll make sense. Or that's the hope. That's the prayer. If not, blame it on us bringing forward an hour. We think about that word there, despise. Despise. It literally means uh, to reject. Or to abhor the idea to refuse something or to reject something with uh, contempt and with disdain. The idea that I'm refusing it, but it also suggests a strong negative reaction to what I am refusing. That I'm rejecting it, I'm refusing it, and I'm looking upon it as something that is beneath consideration. I'm rejecting it, and I'm viewing it as something that is worthless, something that is deserving of scorn. I'm resisting it, I'm refusing it, and I'm treating it as something to hate or disgust. I'm despising it. On a lighter note, we might say I'm taking it lightly. I'm ridiculing it. I'm disrespecting it. And in the context of this verse, the father warns the son, God, by way of extension, warning his people uh, against dismissing uh, or ridiculing or disrespecting or abhorring or making scorn or mockery of the discipline of the Lord. Now that word discipline is often translated, and I'm sure it's translated in your Bible, perhaps it says instruction. Uh, perhaps your Bible says chastisement. Uh, in the Hebrew, this word is used throughout the Old Testament, particularly in the uh, wisdom literature, literature, and it describes, it describes the process of training. Uh, we'll look at it how it's used in the New Testament, but the idea normally is the process of of training and molding and developing a child, molding their mind, more molding their morality, molding their conduct. It encompasses uh, educating them and training them and teaching them and guiding them into uh, towards a, a certain path, towards the right path. And as we talked about, when we're talking about a discipline and instruction and that type of guidance, the key initial element is teaching. It's the idea of giving detailed information, helping the individual, helping the child to know what is acceptable and unacceptable, helping to un- helping them to understand what they should do and should not do. The first step is instruction. Uh, it's teaching. It's the idea of molding their character, molding that person through reproof and admonition. And sometimes uh, that instruction, sometimes uh, that verbal training 
can be and needs to be a little sharp. Thus, we have the word chastisement. Uh, you think about what it means to chastise. We might have, you might have in your Bible the idea of to, to rebuke. Uh, the idea to express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behaviors or their actions. The idea that you reprimand sharply. Some other words we might use might mean to scold or to berate or to admonish, to chide, to censure, to castigate, to lecture. Or to criticize. Listen, God's children. The text is admonishing us. Do not despise the training, the education, the tutelage, the mentoring, if you will. The training process of whom? The Lord. Not a man, but the Lord. As we touched on last week, that word there in the Hebrew, the tetragrammaton, those Hebrew letters that are often used, those three Hebrew letters that are often used to describe the proper name of the God of Israel. Y-H-W-H. Sometimes we pronounce it as Yahweh or Jehovah or Jehovah. But the point is, and many scholars would say to this, that the primary meaning of this name, this Yahweh or Jehovah, is that it refers to the self-existent nature of God, his eternal nature, the idea that God is the great I am. And so the verse is exhorting us not to take lightly, not to spurn, not to disrespect, not to disregard, not to ridicule, not to mock, not to disdain, not to hate, not to scoff at the training and the teaching and the education that the almighty God of heaven, the self-existent one, the one who exists outside of time, as a matter of fact, he created time. The one who is, has no creator, but he created all things and sustains all things. The all-powerful, omniscient one. He says, don't disregard. Don't disrespect. Don't take lightly. But he is instructing and teaching and training and guiding you forward. So it helps us to understand as we think about the Lord's discipline, it denotes the origin or the source of this training. It comes from the Lord, uh, indicating the God of heaven. That is not an arbitrary. This is not arbitrary instruction or meaningless, but purposeful and grounded in the character and love of the God of heaven. Uh, the Lord's discipline implies the instruction and training and chastisement by God. It's not merely punitive. Oftentimes when we think about uh, discipline and reproof, we just think uh, punitive punishment or the rod. It's not merely punitive, but its primary purpose is educational to guide and improve the individual's moral character and their spiritual well-being. Now, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Because as we think of Proverbs 3, uh, 11 and 12, uh, and Hebrews 12, uh, specifically verses 5 through 11, I want us to really grasp the understanding that this phrase, to do not despise the Lord's discipline, it speaks uh, to a very foundational aspect of the relationship between God and his people. And that's understanding uh, that God, the understanding of God as a loving father. He is a loving father, but he does discipline. He does train his children for their own good. And that training isn't always fun. It isn't always pleasurable. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, we find a parallel, uh, a New Testament parallel of Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. Uh, we find a parallel of that in Hebrews 12, 5, uh, verses 
Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, where discipline is seen as a sign of God's fatherly love uh, and commitment to our growth. Think about that. God's discipline as a sign of God's love and his commitment to our growth. God's discipline as a sign of his love and his commitment to your growth, to my growth. Just to put the passage, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, in its context, uh, we think about the book of Hebrews, uh, and the overarching theme is the supremacy of Christ. Uh, the book of Hebrews, it opens with the declaration that Christ is better. Christ is superior. We look at chapter one. It points out that Christ is superior. He is better than the angels. You go to chapter three and it points out that Christ is superior. If you will, he's better than Moses. Uh, you look at verses four through seven and it points out that Christ in his priesthood is superior. It's better than the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood. You go into chapters 8 through 10 and the book of Hebrews makes it clear that Christ is superior. His covenant is a better covenant built upon better promises. Now, within this context, these uh, things are outlined because the Hebrews writer is writing to an audience and he's calling them to persevere in the faith. Persevere in the faith. Persevere in the faith amidst hardships and persecutions. Persevere in the faith amidst hardships and persecutions. I want to say that 10 more times to me. He's calling his audience to persevere in the faith amidst hardships and persecutions because the audience of the Hebrews, this Hebrew audience, face challenges. Uh, they face challenges and pressures. Uh, that tempted them to abandon uh, their Christian faith. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, just before we get to the discipline passage, these believers are encouraged. You look at verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded uh, by so great a cloud of witnesses, Speaking of those who are outlined in chapter 11, what we often refer to as faith's hall of fame. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Every weight and sin which clings so closely to us and let us run with what does your Bible say there? My Bible says endurance, same thing. Let us run with patience, endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto whom? As we're running this Christian race, as we are exhorted to endure, to be steadfast, our eyes have to be fixed on who? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the founder, the originator, and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy? Did the Lord have to endure some things? Well, that's one of the things I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll say it now. That's one of the things I love about the God of heaven. He doesn't ask us to do anything. He's not willing to do himself first. He's the greatest leader, the greatest father. He doesn't want you to do anything. He won't do first for you and me. I love it. I love him for that. I love it. Looking unto Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross. He didn't despise the instruction of the Lord, but he despised the shame that would come as a consequence of obeying his Lord or his God, his father. But he despised that shame. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now in verses three and four, he starts to impress upon the minds that they don't need to grow weary. He says, for consider him, Jesus, who has endured. There goes that word again. 
such hostility by sinners against himself. Consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What needs to be your focus in the difficult times? Christ. He endures so you won't lose heart. He says in verse four, for you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And so the discipline discussed in verses five through 11 is framed as a part of this endurance, this enduring of hard times, this enduring of difficulties in living and holding on to the Christian faith amidst opposition and resistance and persecution, teaching what he's going to outline. Uh, that the hardships are used by God to train and strengthen his children. You ought to say amen about that. That the hardships uh, that he is expecting you, child of God, to endure. Because they will train and strengthen and refine and perfect you. So, verse number five of Hebrews 12, and just, we won't be long. The Hebrews writer says in verse five, and have you forgotten? Uh, the exhortation, the divine word of encouragement, which is addressed to you as sons. My son, uh, do not regard lightly the discipline, the education, the training, the tutorage of the Lord, nor faint, nor lose heart, nor give up when you are reproved or rebuked by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Maybe your Bible says chastens and he scourges. Literally, he flogs. Literally, I like this word better. He whips. This is another lesson, maybe next week. Listen to me, Christian parent. Our parenting should mimic the God we serve. Our parenting should mimic, imitate God's parenting. You'll say that's not for right now. Just put that in your piggy bank. And we'll, we'll withdraw on it later. For those whom the Lord, verse 6 again, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges, he flogs, he whips, he punishes, maybe your Bible says, every son whom he receives. And so once again, verses 5 and 6, echoing what we saw, really quoting Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, echoing the idea that God's discipline is a sign of love. It affirms that God disciplines us and it's motivated not by his anger, not motivated just by displeasure, but it's motivated by love, much like a parent disciplining discipline giving discipline to a child that they love but also this discipline it uh, this divine discipline is an indication it's an indication of our identity as God's children whom he loves whom he loves and he is committed to our growth keep that in your mind God loves you and he's committed to your growth as a child of God committed to your growth not necessarily your pleasure Committed to your growth and your development morally and spiritually, not necessarily your earthly happiness. Verse 7. It is for discipline, he's saying to these Christians. Why do you need to endure these hardships? Why do you need to endure this difficulty? He says it's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Once again, the Hebrews writer impressing upon their minds and ours that enduring the hardships 
as discipline, a mark of being a true child of God. But in doing this, it's a form of, of, of training. It's a form of, of teaching and instruction that is to be gained. The idea that enduring the hardships uh, helps us uh, when we understand that it is for discipline, for our instruction and our development and our maturation. We understand and can accept difficult times as part of God's training and shaping of the human soul. Verse 8, he says, but if you are without Discipline, of which all have become partakers. You are illegitimate children. I think some versions actually say bastards. And not sons. Pointing out the universal, nat universal nature of this discipline. And in this context, this discipline is the endurance of trials hardships, and difficulties in the pursuit of the heavenly crown. Understanding that every child of God, I don't care what the televangelists, as my mentor used to call them, hell evangelists say, that if you follow God, if you follow Jesus, you'll always be happy, wealthy, oh, happy, wealthy, and healthy. Can't find that in the book. The Hebrews writer, and we'll track it further, makes it clear that every child whom the Lord loves and in this context is going to experience discipline and that being hardships, difficulties, trials. It comes with the territory. There's no way around it. Do you understand that? Do you accept that? Now we not. It's easy to say yes, right? We pointed it out earlier in the text. Who had to endure some things? Who endured the cross? The perfect one, the Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Who? Jesus. Did he have to endure some hardships and suffering? You turn back a few chapters to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, verses 7 through 9. And I certainly, but this is divine commentary on Jesus in that garden of Gethsemane. And Christian, listen to me. When you find yourself asking why me, when you find yourself thinking, you know, I've been so good, I've been so right, I've dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's, why, why isn't my prayer being answered the way I want it to be answered? I've been trying to do everything that I can, and normally we have a much higher estimation of ourselves than is accurate, but sometimes we get beside ourselves. <laughs> I've been so good. Why is God allowing me to endure this? I want you to think about Jesus, because he was perfect, sinless. In the days of his humanity, New American Standard Version, Jesus is speaking of he offered up prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears. I'm not making light of this, but I imagine this being that ugly face crying. Unrestrained crying and pleading from his heart. With prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears to who? To the one who was able to save him from death. He's pleading to the father. The father is able to save him. I think we sung the song he could have called 10,000 angels, could he not? Pleading with the one who had the power to save him. And he was heard. Did he hear him? Just because God doesn't respond the way you want him to doesn't mean he doesn't hear you. The Bible says, and he was heard. He was heard because of his devout behavior, because he was who he was, because he was devout. He was heard because of his sinlessness and his unfailing determination to do the father's will. He was heard. But guess what? Although he was sinless, 
Although he was crying and begging and pleading with the one who was able to save him. Although he was a son. There were some things he had to endure. So that he could learn some things. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Some of y'all looking at me funny saying, how does, how did Jesus have to learn something? Well, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In eternity, he existed in complete equality with the other members of the Godhead. Submitting to someone else's will was a learned activity. But he was willing to lower himself, make himself of no reputation, being found in a form of man and placing himself under the Father. And even though he wanted to be released from enduring what he had to endure for your salvation and mine. If there's any other way, Lord, please. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he was perfected by the suffering. He became the source, the author of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. I ask you this question, and then we'll move on as you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You ever think about what it would mean for you and me, you and I, you and me, if he didn't endure? You ever think about what it might mean, what it, what it would mean if he, if he stopped, if God sent those 10,000 angels, if he didn't allow that to perfect him, if he didn't uh, persevere. Think about this idea of this training, this training through hardships and difficulties. I mean, think about what the Apostle Paul says to Paul, says to T Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 10, he says, you, however, uh, have followed my teaching, Paul says to Timothy. You followed my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. He said, not only that, you see my persecutions and sufferings. We've been talking about this in our Acts class that happened to me at Antioch at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions, there's that word again, I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. The punchline in verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus might. You will. If you're going to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. So everyone in the household got to get their medicine sometime. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10. Hebrews right, he goes on and he further says, furthermore. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. And guess what? We gave them respect. Hopefully we did. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good. So that we may share his holiness. Uh, the Hebrews writer, he contrasts, uh, he highlights the contrast between human and divine discipline. 
And he points out that God's discipline is always perfect and it's always for our good, designed to make us partakers of his holiness. This helps us to understand and to trust in God's wisdom and the purpose behind his discipline, understanding that the goal, the goal of the discipline, the goal of the training, especially in this context as it pertains from discipline coming from enduring hardships and challenges, uh, that the goal of it is uh, transformative. The The goal of it is redemptive. The purpose behind the discipline. It's more than correction, but it is to elevate us so that we can be partakers of the divine nature. So that we might share in his holiness. Verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems to be not to be pleasant. It ain't no fun. It's painful. Yet, those who have been trained by it afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. going to stop here. And we'll go further this evening. I really want you to think, Christian. Because I imagine you, uh, I'm not the only one who has endured challenges and hardships uh, as they do their best, uh, imperfect best to hold on to the Lord's hand. And in that process, uh, I imagine that there's many of you in this audience who could say you're dealing with some difficulties. You're dealing with some challenges. Uh, You're dealing with some opposition. That opposition might be in your home. Uh, That opposition might be uh, in your workplace. I hope it ain't, but it could be in the church house. But how are you viewing the opposition? How are you viewing the hardship and the trial? How are you viewing it? Are you seeing it perhaps? Are you allowing yourself to step back and think there's a lesson and a blessing here for me? See, I make no qualms about it. The God that we serve, I'm not saying that he causes everything you endure, but he does allow it. And I firmly believe that if he allows it, there's some there's a lesson and a blessing in it for you. But are you letting and trusting the process? Are you taking your medicine? Are you extrapolating? The lesson you are supposed to learn, the blessing you are supposed to receive, because until we learn the lesson, we're going to stay repeating. I'm telling you, back up. Think about the difficulty. Step back, and we'll talk more about this tonight. And think, how is the Lord perhaps using this sickness? How is the Lord perhaps using this problem in my marriage? How is perhaps the Lord trying to use what I think to be a problem and a difficulty to help me be better, stronger, more mature, of greater service for him? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Uh, we just thank you for being the God that you are. 
in our wildest dreams, we could never imagine a greater God than you. We thank you for your great love for us, your patience, your mercy, your forgiveness. And Father, we truly, we truly want to be grateful for your training and discipline, even when it's hard and it's painful. Uh, we pray that you will help us to trust you and your guidance. And we pray that you will help us to learn what we need to learn, what you want us to learn, to receive what you want us to receive uh, from every trial and every difficult circumstance. Help us to honor you in all things. Help us to surrender uh, all uh, to your rule. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Perhaps there's one in the audience who hasn't surrendered their life uh, to King Jesus um, by putting him on through the obedience of the gospel. Uh, and if you have not do that, have not done that, uh, you can do it uh, right now. Uh, if you're ready, I would encourage you not to delay uh, because tomorrow is not promised. Uh, tonight is not promised. Uh, truthfully, the next hour is not promised. You could go back here right now and swallow a bit of food like me and that vitamin. Might not come up for you. Not to be morbid, but it happens to people all the time. People drop dead from heart attacks and aneurysms all the time. They go to sleep and don't wake up. No one knows why. Not to scare you, but to impress upon your mind and my mind the urgency of doing whatever we need to do to be right with God, to do it now. Now. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we pray that you will. Uh, hoping and praying that you believe and know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose again on the third day. Those foundational facts of the gospel, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent, to change your mind, to adopt the mind of Christ, Acts 2.38? Are you willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8? And then are you willing to uh, submit to being baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Mark 16.15-16, through 16, Jesus told his disciples, you go into all the world, you preach that gospel to everyone, everyone, black, yellow, red, black, or white, they all precious in his sight. You preach it to every creature, and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you're ready to put on Christ, we're ready to assist you in any way that we can. If you are in Christ, as you're thinking about the challenges, as you're thinking about the difficulties, may we surrender to God. If we can pray for you or with you or encourage you in any way, please come forward. Make it known as we stand and as we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is called. Mercy. 
Christ is for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, promised for you and for me. sin he has mercy and pardon pardon for you and for me come home come home ye who are we Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Just real quick before uh, we dismiss, uh, we do have our potluck uh, immediately following service. Group three does have cleanup and sit and um, set up. So we just invite all our visitors to please uh, join us in fellowship for the potluck. Also immediately following service, the elders and deacon handshake will happen just over here to my right for a brief meeting. Uh, we'll do that right after service. We'll have our closing prayer. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Lord God, Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today thanking you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here today to hear another powerful message from you. Lord, we ask you to defeat us in the things that we would do that would be contrary to your will. Submit to you, Lord, 100%. Lord, we ask you to be with those who are unable to be here today. Strengthen them so that then the next appointed time they may be here to worship with us. Lord, we ask you to be with those who are traveling, guide them, allow them to arrive at their destination safely. Lord, we ask you to please be with those who are mentally not able to be with us. Lord, as we go from here today, we ask you to keep us safe, keep us in your hedge of protection, bring us back at the next appointed time. Lord, as we depart here and we go back to fellowship, we ask you, Lord, please bless the food that we're about to eat, that it may strengthen our bodies so that we can serve you in the future. And we ask that the fellowship that we have Strengthen us spiritually. Lord, it's all these things that we ask in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.